This morning, as a congregation in a Christian community, we find ourselves in the fourth week in the season of Lent, that season that goes from Ash Wednesday through Easter Sunday, where we specifically remember the sacrifice of Christ and his resurrection from the dead that gives us the hope from all of our sins. For this season of Lent as a church, we've been working through the book of Habakkuk. And we're going to continue that this morning, but to just catch everyone up and put us all on the same same page, let me quickly again review the whole scenario of where we've been thus far. The book of Habakkuk was written in the early years of 600 BC. It was written at a time to the nation of Judah, having seen Israel fall 100 years earlier when Judah was, was following in their footsteps. They were a nation of injustice. They were a nation of idolatry. They were not being the people God had called them to be. And because of that, Habakkuk looks at the situation and he asks the question, how long? How long, God, are you going to look at your people and ignore the injustice that's going on? And God, in his grace, responded to Habakkuk and he said, not very long. I've been doing something. I've been raising up the Chaldeans. That's better known as the Babylonians, and that's how I'm going to refer to them for the rest of the service, and they are going to come, and like the greedy nation that they are, they're going to wipe out many people, including Judah. And while that answered Habakkuk's first question, it raised another, which was why? Why God would use a more wicked and evil people like the Babylonians to bring justice against the the people of Judah? That doesn't seem to make sense. And last week we saw that Habakkuk says, I'm going to wait for your answer and hear it. And God gave an answer. And his answer was that he started, it lasted in the first five verses of chapter 2, saying that in general, Babylon too would fall. That even though God was using them as a tool, that they too would have their sins judged. In general, because of their pride and because of their drunkenness, they were a nation that was going to fall. Well, what God covered last week in generalities, or what we looked at last week in generalities, he's now going to get more into the specifics. And so that's where we pick up in in Habakkuk chapter 2, verses 6 through 20. That's found starting on page 934 of your pew Bibles. And once again, as a reminder, at the end of the text, I'm going to say this is the word of the Lord, inviting you to respond with thanks be to God. Again, chapter 2, verse 6 through 20. Shall not all these take up their taunt against him with scoffing and riddles for him and say, Woe to him who heaps up what is not his own, for how long, and loads himself with pledges? Will not your debtors suddenly arise and those awake who will make you tremble? Then you will be spoil for them. Because you have plundered many nations, all the remnant of the people shall plunder you for the blood of man and violence to the earth, to cities and all who dwell in them. Woe to you who gets evil gain from his house, to set his nest on high, to be safe from the reach of harm. You have devised shame for your house by cutting off many peoples. You have forfeited your life, for the stone will cry out from the wall, and the beam from the woodwork respond. Woe to him who builds a town with blood and founds a city on iniquity. Behold, it is not from the Lord of hosts that people's labors are merely for fire, and nations weary themselves for nothing. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Woe to him who makes his neighbors drink. You pour out your wrath and make them drunk in order to gaze upon their nakedness. You will have your fill of shame instead of glory. Drink yourself and show your uncircumcision. The cup of the Lord's right hand will come around to you and utter shame will come upon your glory. The violence done in Lebanon will overwhelm you as will the destruction of the beasts that terrified them, for the blood of man and violence to the earth, to cities and all who dwell in them. What profit is an idol when its maker has shaped it, a metal image, a teacher of lies? For its maker trusts in his own creation when he makes speechless idols. Woe to him who says to a wooden thing, Awake! 
to a silent stone. Arise! Can this teach? Behold, it is overlaid with gold and silver, and there is no breath at all in it. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Although I hear Bibles shutting, I encourage you to keep them open if possible, as I'm going to be working through the text once again, and it might be helpful to refer back to some of the things that we've already read. As many of you are aware, my wife, Jen, is a preschool teacher. And as a preschool teacher, she has a primary responsibility of trying to instruct these young children into proper behavior within the classroom, which you might imagine is a difficult and ongoing challenge for three-year-olds. Well, one of the techniques that she used to help with this is called if-then. Very often, she will stop her children and remind them of the consequences of the choices that they are making. And so she'll say something like, if you're able to sit still at carpet time, then know that you will have more time during playtime. Or, if you're one of the people that can help clean everything up now, then know that you'll have greater outside time. Now, most of the time, this is used in positive terms to try to encourage them to make the right choices in order to receive the rewards that are possibly out there. But there are other times when it's used to highlight negative examples. For example, if you keep hitting your friends, then they're not going to want to play with you very much. Another name for that might be dealing with natural consequences. When you are mean then as a natural consequence, other people will probably try to avoid you. So be nice, and they're more likely to be nice and respond. What my wife in preschool term calls if-then or natural com- not natural consequences, the commentators on the passage that we just read called it reciprocal justice. It's the concept that lays behind the statement an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. It's the negative side of the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. If you behave in a certain way, then as natural consequences or as reciprocal justice, you should expect the world to treat you in return the same way. And that's exactly what we have in our text. Having said in general that the nation of Babylon will fall because of their pride and because of their drunkenness, now in our text, God goes through and gives five woes against the nation of Babylon. And each one of those woes is basically set up as an if-then, or in some ways a since-then, because they've already done these things. What it does is it describes the wrong thing that the nation had done, the incorrect way that they had acted, and then the consequences that they should expect as a result for that behavior. So what I'm going to do this morning is walk through and briefly explain what those five woes are, what they look like, so that we understand the language. But then I'm going to try to explain a little bit about how those five woes actually apply to us today and what we can learn And then finally, I'm going to ask the question, if this is a reciprocal justice, is there any hope for breaking the cycle of you did this to me, so I do this to you, so that you do this to me? Can we ever escape that ongoing cycle? So let's dig into the text. We start verse 6, and God says, knowing that you are a prideful and a drunken nation... Eventually, all of those people that you attacked, that you ravenously destroyed and you wiped over, they're one day going to stand up and they're going to taunt you. And they're going to taunt you with these five woes. The first woe comes in verses 6 through 8. And basically, it's a woe that talks about the theft of the Babylonians. In essence, what he's saying is that as they've moved from nation to nation, and as they've robbed those nations of their possessions and of their lands, of the lives of those that they loved, what Babylon has been doing has been in some ways making a little bit of a deposit or an investment. But instead of investing in the riches of themselves and their own nation, really what they're investing in is the ongoing and growing wrath of the other nations. 
And so as they attack and wipe out more and more nations, they are increasing the number of people that are frustrated and angry that their things had been taken. And eventually that number is going to grow to a certain point where those nations are going to gather together and they're going to have no more of Babylon and then they will treat Babylon in the same way that they themselves were treated. They're going to steal They're going to rob, they're going to remove the things that were taken from them. Since Babylon had been aggressive and they had stolen so many things that did not belong to them, then they should expect that those others will one day rise and plunder them. The second woe is found in verses 9 through 11. This woe talks about the fact that the Babylonians were trying to find security in their wealth and in their possessions. So having raised up all of this wealth and all of this money, having taken from the other nations, their great hope was that they could build for themselves walls of security, that they would be protected from harm and future generations would be protected from harm. But the reality was this was just another demonstration of their greed. And instead of offering them security, it just put a target on their back, a greater and greater target again. And so the declaration is, woe to them, because as they seek security in something other than God, as they seek security in their wealth and their possessions, the reality is the very stones that they're using to try to build up that security will cry out against them. The rafters will be responding and they will lose and have forfeited their very lives. The third woe is in verses 12 through 14. That last woe ended with a discussion about building. And that idea of building is is brought up again in this woe. The Babylonians were trying to build something. They were trying to build a great kingdom. They were trying to build an empire. But the foundation of that empire was, as we've talked before, their own glory. The foundation was their greed. The foundation was their desire to use injustice in order to benefit themselves. Well, if that's the foundation of this kingdom, this society that they are trying to build, the woe is that it's going to completely collapse because no society built on the foundation of self-glory lasts very long. If that's how you build, if that's what you build upon, it will all crumble and fall apart. All of your effort will be wasted. All of the things that you build will only be destined for the fire and a waste of the builder's time. But God says, my glory is what is the firm foundation. When Babylon falls, my glory will be elevated and people will recognize that I am the God over all nations. I am in control of all things and my name will go forth and your name will mean nothing. Since the very foundation of the empire was self-glory and pride, then the nation would never last and God's glory would overwhelm them. The fourth woe, found in verses 15 through 17, The if and since part of this woe talks about abuse of of other people. And commentators debate about whether they're talking about a particular person, maybe the king of Babylon doing this, or as a nation as a whole. You will recall when we talked about the character of the Babylonians, how they were known for mocking and shaming those that they defeated by leading them away to exile with hooks in their nose. Their attempt was to shame, to humiliate, to overpower. And what God says is, if that is the way that you've treated other people, then you too will have your shame exposed to all. That you will drink of the wine to let down your guard, and you will be exposed for what the, 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 the shameful person that you are to all nations. For the first time in verse 16, we actually hear God actively being involved when he says, the cup of my, the Lord's right hand will be around them. Many recognize that as the cup of God's wrath, that as they have tried to pour it out on others will eventually come back to them that they must drink of themselves. So it is the the abuse of other people. 
But then in verse 17, the, the talk of God, the abuse that they enacted continues, but the objects of that abuse changes. It talks about the nation of, of Lebanon and the destruction that happened there. Lebanon was known for its cedars. The cedars of Lebanon were collected and used for the building of God's very own temple. And many people believe that what is talked about here is how Babylon, has gone, how Babylon had gone through Lebanon and wiped the earth clean of the riches of the beauty of these trees. Similarly, there's references to the beasts. The animals that lived. And so not only had Babylon abused people, but they'd also abused God's creation and they'd abused animals. And God says, I've seen all of that. And I will not hold you unaccountable for any of it. As you've wrought destruction upon people, my earth and animals, you too will receive that destruction and that wrath. The fifth and final woe is in verses 18 through 20. This woe addresses the issue of idolatry, and the, and the pattern changes a little bit. It starts with a question. The question being, what good is it to look to an idol for direction? And the text highlights the hypocrisy that Isaiah often highlights in many parts of his text about the irony where people will take a, a, a rock or, or a piece of wood or some metal and they themselves will fashion it into an image and then they will look to that image for protection, for insight and direction. And almost in a mockingly way, mocking way, Habakkuk and God highlights the absurdity of saying, this thing has no breath in it. It can't answer your questions. It's a fool who makes something that says, guide me and direct me. And it's a, a, a false way of living, but that's how the Babylonians lived. The objects may have been beautiful and well-made, but they were pointless and worthless. Instead, God was the one who sits on high. He is that great king that we've been talking about. He is the one who's seated in his temple authority, with authority over all things. He speaks. Instead of us seeking him, asking him to speak as the, as the idolaters begged their idols to speak. He says, we are the ones who are silenced in his very presence. Five times over and over again in specific detail, what happens in this text is the if-then, the reciprocal justice. Since you have oppressed, since you have abused, since you have destroyed, you should expect nothing less than the very same to be meted out upon you. And in fact, that is exactly what is going to happen. Habakkuk, no, that yes, I am raising up the Babylonians to bring justice against the nation of Judah, but they too will have to face their own justice because of the ways that they have behaved. Now, having said all of that, the great temptation is to look upon the judgment of the Babylonians and to celebrate that. Good. The bad guys are getting exactly what they deserve. When they treat others wrongly, they're going to have that come back to them. We celebrate that for this text. We celebrate it in our world. When those that have done evil to others get exposed and revealed and they have to face the consequences. Good. I don't think I'm the only one that couldn't help but read some of the texts that talked about, I think it was the the fourth woe of, of abuse of people and, and think of, of people in our culture like Harvey Weinstein who had used drink and their power to abuse others and now their shame has been exposed and their name has been denigrated and we say, yes, justice, that's right. But then we also have to be careful because we want to never forget where this all goes back to. The book did start with dealing with God's people and their injustice and the things that were going on in the community that was supposed to be the Lord's. And we have to look at ourselves and our own communities. Have we unfairly advantaged off of the backs of other people? When we haven't prepared for a test, are we too quick to steal the preparations and the answers from other people? Are we too quick to take away what belongs to others? If so, 
our possessions are vulnerable? Do we try to find security in our finances, in our wealth, and in our treasures? Do we think that if we build up enough for ourselves that we'll be taken care of, and then we hoard our possessions rather than use them for the developing of God's kingdom as he's called us to? Are we trying to build something in this life? Whether it's a a good home, a great family, or a wonderfully prosperous business. And yet in doing so, the foundation that we're laying is our own glory so that other people can look at us and say, boy, you've done so well for yourself. You ought to be really proud instead of giving God the glory. Because if the foundation is for our pride and our glory, the whole thing that we are trying to build will crumble and fall apart. Do we ever take advantage or abuse other people? In their simplicity, or in who they are, or who we think we are, do we take advantage of our power? We try to make fun of others, bully them, push them around for our entertainment, for our joy. If so, our shame will be exposed and we'll pay the consequences. While we might laugh at the foolishness of making an image and then praying to it, asking for it to guide and direct us, what idols are in our lives that we give far too much credit than what they're worth? What do we look to to give us peace, security, and comfort other than God? And in light of all of that, what do we deserve in response? What's the reciprocal justice that should be meted out against us as over and over again we continue to violate God's commands and his covenant. Sin has consequences. Sin has to be dealt with. And if we do one thing to others, we can expect that justice will come, which does lead to that big question. If justice is reciprocal, can we ever escape what seems to be like the cycle that I talked about of, well, you did this to me, so now I'm going to do that to you, and maybe a little more. So then you feel obligated to do this to me, and then I do that to you, and then you, and it goes on and on and on and envelops more and more people. Can and how, that cycle ever be broken? And the answer is yes. I'm going to highlight a few ways how as we conclude this morning. <coughs> the first way to break this cycle of, uh, or cycle of reciprocal justice is to repent. It's to look at your own life and to be sure that you are not the one that is taking from others, abusing others or God's creation, stealing, self-glorifying, etc. We have the ability to start this cycle. And we, like all people, can be tempted to use others in order to advance ourselves, to get a little bit more ahead, to put a few more bucks in our pocket. But we need to repent. We need to carefully examine the choices that we make. And we need to make sure that rather than abusing others, we are blessing others. And so in a little bit, I'm going to lead us in a prayer of repentance at the end of this sermon where we can reflect on those areas that we feel still fall short And then ask that God might forgive us. And that's the second way, and really the only final way that this cycle ends. It says instead of getting what we deserve in reciprocal justice, it's getting the grace that Jesus offers to us. Jesus says in Matthew 5, You've heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, Do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you, and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. Now, many have looked at those things that, God, that Jesus laid out and the way that he calls us to live, and you say, uh, that sounds impossible. How do I take someone who slaps me and not slap them back, but instead say, here's my other cheek? How do I take from someone who's abused me, who's harmed me, who's hurt me, and instead of praying for their justice and their destruction, say, I'm going to pray for your blessing and support? 
The reality is it's an impossible way to live without the grace of Christ. Because that's exactly why Jesus came to this earth. And it's exactly what we celebrate in this season of Lent. What do we deserve for the sins that we've committed against God? We deserve nothing but reciprocal justice. As we deny and reject God, what we deserve is for him to do the very same to us and say, okay, I will give you exactly what you want, a life and existence without me. And that's what he gives to us. And that's what we call hell, an existence without God forever, which is fire and pain and torture because God is love and light. That's what we deserve. But sin has to be dealt with. Sin must be handled. And instead of us receiving what we deserve, Jesus went to the cross and he took all of God's wrath against our sins and all of the justice that we deserve. And instead of giving us what we deserve, he gives us grace. And he says, you can be forgiven. You can start over. You can have a right relationship with God. And then instead of being forever separated from me, getting what you don't deserve, you can be forever welcomed into my eternal glory and have a right relationship with me. That is the message of grace. And now when we look to Christ in faith, not only do we find that forgiveness that we need ourselves, but we find the capacity to forgive others. Now we don't need to seek their justice and retribution, but we can trust that Christ put all of that to death. And instead of seeking punishment, we can pursue grace. That same grace that we received from Christ. Babylon was wicked. And because of that, they should expect and did receive that wickedness to be turned back on them. Their empire was destroyed after God had used them. It's what all wicked people should get. Reciprocal justice. If, then. But grace interrupts that process. Jesus paid that consequences so that I can forgive and move on. He did it for me, which is what was celebrated for Grayson again this morning. Again, Grayson, even as an infant, for the rest of his life can know that every time he makes a mistake, God, and because of his promises made today, will always be there to say, but I'm going to give you grace instead of what you deserve. What a joyous blessing that we can celebrate each and every day in the season of Lent. And because of that grace, may it call us to live not only in repentance, but also in faith, pursuing that right life that God calls us to. Well, as I said, we're going to end then with a responsive reading. A responsive reading that helps us to focus on our sin. To confess it before God, to leave it behind, and seek the, just, sorry, seek the grace that only he can offer. Uh, the words will be on the screen. I invite you to respond with me in the emboldened words. Let us pray. Holy and merciful God. We confess to you and to one another and to the whole communion of saints in heaven and on earth that we have sinned by our own fault in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We have not forgiven others as we have been forgiven. Have mercy on us, O oh God. We have not listened to your call to serve as Christ served us. We have not been true to the mind of Christ. We have grieved your Holy Spirit. Have mercy on us, O oh God. We confess to you, O oh God, all our past unfaithfulness, the pride, hypocrisy, and impatience in our lives. We confess to you, O oh God, our self-indulgent appetites and ways and our exploitation of other people. We confess to you, O oh God, our anger at our, own at our own frustration and our envy 
of those more fortunate than ourselves. We confess to you, O God. Our intemperate love of worldly goods and comforts and our dishonesty in daily life and work, we confess to you, O God. Our negligence in prayer and worship and our failure to commend the faith that is in us, we confess to you, O God. Accept our repentance, O God, for the wrongs we have done, for the neglect of human need and suffering and our indifference to injustice and cruelty. Accept our repentance, O God. For all false judgments, for uncharitable thoughts toward our neighbors, and for our prejudice and contempt toward those who differ from us, accept our repentance, O God. For our waste and pollution of your creation and our lack of concern for those who come after us, accept our repentance, O God. Restore us, O God, and let your anger depart from us. Favorably hear us, O God, for your mercy is great. Let's continue in our prayer. Lord God, your mercy is great. Your mercy is given to us because of what your Son did, so that rather than receiving what we deserve, we get your love. It's the greatest gift we could ever receive. It's beyond our hope and our imagining. Thank you for that gift. And having received it, may we share with others. May we be willing to know that grace and show that grace to all who come in our paths. Father, may this be the call of our lives as you have redeemed and saved us. We pray in Jesus' holy and merciful name. Amen.